controversial opinion, Joker Folia Du isn't just great, it makes the first movie better. Hello and welcome back to Ruben Uncut. Today I'm talking about Joker Folia Du. Uh, which is a term that, I won't lie, I went into the movie thinking to myself, is there going to be a plot twist involving this term? Folia du. Which uh, normally refers to me mental illness shared between two people, typically twins. Spoilers, they're not twins. There's no incest angle to this movie. But the term folia du does seem pretty relevant to what's going on in the film with Joker and... Harley Quinn over here. Now, I need to address my statement. I said that I don't just think this movie is good, I think this movie makes the previous movie better. Now, I can't entirely get into all of that without getting into spoilers. So, don't worry, I'm gonna address all of that but let's start at the beginning. And by that, I mean the previous movie, which I assume you've seen, it made a lot of money. The original, the first Joker movie follows one Arthur Fleck. Now, I watched the movie through two different lenses when I saw it. The first lens being that of a Batman fan. And the second lens being that of a disability advocate and someone who works in the disability community. Because ultimately, the first Joker movie is a lot about disability, but also mental illness, which, in its, which is its own type of disability, really. Now, the first movie I liked best as a Joker movie, and not so much as a disability movie. Allow me to explain. You see, the first movie, being largely about Joker, for me, a lot of the Joker stuff worked. Well, mostly. I did have some specific Joker complaints. Uh, mostly, my thing that drove me crazy when I was watching it, similar to another Batman film, I think it's fucking stupid for Joker to be a minimum of 20 years older than Batman. I'm... Sorry, that's just, that's just an incredibly absurd world-building storytelling decision. To be fair, uh, Todd Phillips, not the first person to do that, amazingly, somehow. That being said, the thing that really drew, pulled me in about the previous movie was the transformation of Arthur Fleck into Joker. Now, in terms of disability, what is that movie about? In terms of disability, that movie addresses something that's very real, which is the powerlessness of having disabilities and mental illness. Arthur Fleck was someone buffeted around the system in a constant state of not getting the help he so desperately needed psychologically. He was unhinged from reality often having fantasies that were not real. This is a type of psychosis or uh, delusions of grandeur, one might even say. I'm not qualified to diagnose Joker, but I will say there was a, there's just a lot of clear mental illness going on in the film. However, Joker was also a traumatic brain injury survivor, meaning that his brain was a little fucked up. Now, this is another thing that doesn't really jive well with the Joker mythology. Joker normally being portrayed as a, as a genius, a criminal genius of some kind. Arthur Fleck was not a criminal genius. No, the story of the first Joker is about a man with disabilities discovering, discovering the only power he has. Violence. In that movie, violence begins to make the Joker seem real. He, Arthur Fleck begins to feel like he is finally being seen. And he attributes it all to his discovery of violence. The murder of the men on the subway. That's the violence. It empowered him. He felt an ecstasy of power 
That's why he dances in the bathroom. And Joaquin Phoenix did an amazing job playing this character in his portrayal. Now, there's a lot to unpack there because there are people with disabilities who feel this way. However, it has to be noted, they are not common. People with disabilities tend to run the rate of being shitty human beings at these same percentage points as regular human beings, with the added bonus of actually being pretty oppressed by society. Because people with disabilities have to live with a lot of indignity that you or I will never have. Although arguably I myself have my own minor disabilities. However, you're only as disabled as your disabilities interfere with your life. So mostly my disabilities just make it hard for me to maintain a solid human relationship. Thanks, autism. But back to Joker. So my basic problem was is that while I thought it was a solid, decent examination of this type of power and the helplessness that people with mental illness and disabilities experience in our society, it also, you know, um, is a movie where the success of the main character is their violence a person with disabilities committing horrific acts of violence and being uh, essentially uh, held up by people who adore him for it. And that's sort of where the, la the first movie ends. Now, leaving the first movie with the way it ends, I assumed that the Joker fan theory they were going to play into was the continuous hey, he might be making up his origin story, could all just be in his head type deal. And the first movie gives you a lot to really work with on that. However, the second movie, the second movie surprised me because it in fact goes in a different direction and attaches itself to a completely different Joker fan theory, which I will get into more in spoilers. But going into it, I assumed we were going with the inconsistent origin story. In fact, if this movie had essentially been the same actor having a completely different Joker experience where he becomes the Joker at the end, I would have fucking thought that was awesome. That's not what this movie is. But I did say that this movie is good and that it actually makes the first movie better. Now I'm gonna give it to you straight though. I didn't immediately know that this movie was great. I had to think about this movie for a while, because this movie's a lot to absorb. There's a lot going on, and it's very sad. It makes it good, but it also makes it sad. Much sadder than it previously was. And it was already goddamn sad. Yeah, Joker 2 is going there. So let's talk about Joker 2, or Folia 2. So the first thing about this movie is that it's, it opens with a with a fucking cartoon. That's right, opens with a cartoon. A cartoon that essentially kind of recaps the very end of the first movie. In that cartoon, we see that Joker, uh, Joker is struggling with his shadow. Now, these metaphors will be played out throughout the film, by the way. As the film continues, we meet Joker living in Arkham Asylum. In fact, a large portion of the film takes place in Arkham Asylum. In fact, the film primarily takes place two places, either Arkham Asylum, the courtroom, or some other office where they are getting prepared for the trial. Because this is, at the end of the day, a courtroom drama slash musical. Kind of. It has to be stated that music, that singing only really takes place in two places. The majority of these songs or musical numbers are all figments of Joker's imagination. Uh, they are all sequences, dream sequences, things that he himself is imagining and aggrandizing, romanticizing his own life. But not just his own life, but his relationship with Harley Quinn. When we meet Harley Quinn in the movie, she is also in Arkham Asylum, but in the non-criminally violent wing of Arkham Asylum. There's essentially a wing of Arkham Asylum that is the scariest prison you've ever been in, and another side that is a regular, uh, essentially a regular mental hospital. However, Joker has a chance encounter where he sees Harley Quinn 
um, who is part of the some type of music therapy program at Arkham Asylum, where she is singing in what is essentially a choir, where they sing some kind of pseudo-religious songs, which is unsurprising for the time period of, you know, the 80s, I believe. He proceeds to, of course, fall in love with her. She does a great job of essentially seducing him, which is not hard. He is a lonely, lonely man. We'll get back to Harley Quinn in a minute. There's a lot I have to say about her, but I don't want to get out too out of too ahead of myself here. The other thing that we are immediately introduced to, of course, is his lawyer, who is a very progressive woman who is trying to use the insanity defense to keep him from getting an execution, essentially. She has the idea that they can claim that the Joker is a split personality. Now, the thing about the movie that is occasionally frustrating is the fact that we know the Joker is, we the audience know the Joker is not a split personality. But we also know that he is mentally ill and does have delusions or psychotic episodes. So it's so it can be a little bit frustrating to see them going down this alternate rabbit path instead of focusing on the mental illness he does have. However, there is a thematic reason why they would choose to use this defense. It is also time period accurate. Uh, that, that was the kind of, th people in the 80s uh, we're pretty obsessed with multiple personality disorder. There was a lot of shit going on with it. But that's not, not really super important for this. Well, maybe it adds context. I don't know. Let's move along. But the lawyer has a psychiatrist who is going to diagnose him with this split personality. And Joker is smart enough to pick up on the things that the lawyer wants him to say. This is demonstrated to us when he has an interview with Steve Coogan. Uh, who plays a, a television reporter who's trying to get a lascivious story out of him. Now, actually, I take it back. This is the only time the Joker sings in real life. Now, to be clear, it is also possibly him having a delusion in the middle of an interview, but he does sing in the interview. I forgot about that. He, there is some real life singing. But the important thing is the, the important thing I'm getting at right now is the split personality disorder, because while he does not actually have split personality disorder, it is thematically on point for what the movie is setting up and for what it's trying to tell us the audience. As the movie goes on, I realize something strange about myself watching the film. At a certain point, I realized that I was literally sitting in the theater rooting for chaos. I was waiting for this film to escalate into the exact same sequence type of events that the first movie ended with. Because you see, at this point, my brain believed that I understood the formula, the narrative that they were going for. The thing is, is that I was wrong, that I was dead wrong. That the film wants you to think it's going to play out like the first movie, that this is going to end in the triumph of violence and chaos. And I have to tell you, that is not what happens. The film deliberately plays with your expectations as an audience member, which is a bold move because it's definitely going to piss off stupid people. It's probably going to piss off some not stupid people too. Not everyone enjoys being played with as an audience member. Now for me, artistically, I find it very interesting. Um, I also enjoyed this when James Wan did, the similar, did similar things in his movie Mal uh, Malignant, where all the advertising made you think it was some type of freaky supernatural ghost story. Nope, an insane psycho killer body horror. But let's get back to this. The film is going to play with your expectations based on what happened in the previous film. Now, the connections to the Batman universe here are primarily Arkham Asylum, Harley Quinn, and Harvey Dent, who shows up pre-Two-Face. Will he be Two-Face by the end? One thing that the movie does really well that I think is worth noting is that it does not actually romanticize this relationship. At the begin, at a certain point, we might see like the romance, but at a certain point, it becomes very clear that their relationship is toxic and codependent. And Harley Quinn is a master manipulator who, despite not being a doctor in this movie, is 
someone with a bachelor's in psychology. Sorry, that's kind of a spoiler. Let's move along. At numerous points throughout the film, we discover that Harley Quinn is pretty much every toxic woman trope you could possibly imagine. Um, she is manipulative. She loves him for all the wrong reasons. In fact, actually, and this is what's real. This is important. This is the point. She doesn't love Arthur Fleck. She loves the Joker. And in fact, it's not just her. The people out in the streets, the people wearing clown makeup and masks and signs that free, that say, that are holding signs. Those signs don't say free Arthur Fleck. Those signs say free the Joker. Harley Quinn doesn't like Joker's lawyer. Harley Quinn continuously gets into fights. There are constant conflicts between her and the lawyer. Harley Quinn is very clear about the fact that she thinks that the insane asylum, that the insane defense, insanity defense is wrong. Harley Quinn actually seems to be, while well, a smart psychologist, seems to be very unaware of how the law works and very much seems to be under the impression that the people's love of the Joker would be enough to free him from prison. She wants him to lean into being the Joker while his, while his lawyers are insisting that he not do that. You see, because Harley Quinn doesn't love Arthur Fleck. Harley Quinn loves the Joker. But Harley Quinn is not the Joker's own, is not Arthur Fleck's only significant relationship throughout the film. Arthur Fleck has a very interesting relationship with one of the guards at Arkham Asylum, who seems very friendly towards Joker, but is also abusive at the same time. Throughout the film, I was waiting for Gleason to die. That's the actor who plays the uh, abusive guard waiting and waiting for that revenge, and instead it just got uglier. It has to be stated that the suffering in this film is primarily experienced by the Joker or other inmates of the asylum. All right, I, I cannot hold back any spoilers, any more spoilers in my analysis. I'm going to start saying some shit about this movie that it will be spoilers. Maybe I'll, put th I'll throw up a, a, a spoiler tag or something to let you know it's going to be get spoilery from this point on. In fact, because I can't not talk about this because it's it's so much. There's so it's such an interesting movie with stuff I want to talk to you about. Which is half the reason I fucking love this movie. OK, let's get into it. So other relationships that the Joker has in the insane asylum are, of course, other inmates. Now, a lot of the inmates are not super close to the Joker, but there is at least one young inmate everyone calls Ricky who is always following the Joker around and thinks that Joker is the coolest guy there is. And he tries to be tough like the Joker, but he's not. He, he just isn't. He's a, he's, a, he's a skinny, he's a skinny little, he's a skinny kid with the, some type of mental health problems. He's, well, he's in the, he's in the section for the criminally insane. So yeah. But we'll get back to Ricky because he's very important. Even though he doesn't do a lot, he is actually very important. As the movie goes on, Arthur Fleck's relationship with his lawyer breaks down and he fires her. And he decides to represent himself as the Joker. Doing so in a, I shit you not, proper Southern lawyer accent most of the time. Obviously playing into that comedic trope. Now, this is a questionable decision on Arthur Fleck's part, since he doesn't actually know how to be a lawyer, and we see his notepads are mostly just full of bad jokes about the people he's about to interview. As the film progresses, people become nastier to the Joker, and the Joker becomes more and more the Joker. His relationship with Harley Quinn continues to grow, even though he has been given reasons to not trust her, and even though he has had a dream where she betrays him. There are a lot of dream sequences in here, mostly involving the Joker and Harley Quinn singing to each other. And their singing is surprisingly good while that, well, also they are constantly smoking cigarettes and sounding like people who smoke cigarettes. In fact, the amount of cigarette smoking in this movie is actually profoundly, like I kind of want a cigarette. <laughs> Well, all right, let's 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 move on from that. Uh, but anyways, we sense 
that everything is mounting. Harley Quinn is getting the people ri riled up. Joker is turning his own his own courtroom drama into a shit show. He doesn't understand the first thing about defending himself or even what he should be saying. He has fantasies mid-courtroom about murdering people in the courtroom while sing the song. And then some people, some witnesses are called that start to unhinge him. First of all, Zazie Beetz character returns. Yep, she's alive. She Technically, she comes back before Joker fires his lawyer. In fact, she is what prompts Joker to fire his lawyer. He's so humiliated by her testimony. So humiliated about the things that apparently Joker's mom had told her while, her, while, Joker's, while Arthur's mom was alive. That he loses his mind when Zazie Beetz's character brings up the fact the Joker's mom never thought he was funny. And he fires his lawyer. But there's another witness that gets pulled in who also starts to undo the Joker. It's, it's Puddles. Puddles, of course, being the last name of the man with dwarfism who Joker spared in the first movie. I'm forgetting his first name right now, but his last name is Puddles. It's hard to forget that based on how the movie treats him. And he gets on the stand and Joker prepares to just mock him. He has written down a bunch of short jokes, but something pushes Puddles to the edge. And Puddles, Puddles doesn't call him Joker. Puddles calls him Arthur. Puddles says that Arthur was the only person at their work who was nice to him. And that now he doesn't know how to live because he's afraid all the time. Literally, he saw the only person who was never mean to him murder his other bullying co-worker in front of him. A man that even he, Puddles, said didn't deserve to die like that. Puddles is the only person who knew Arthur, who saw Arthur, the only person who missed Arthur. Puddles eventually leaves the courtroom. The defense rests. The prosecution rests. Joker goes back to the asylum, and that night, he starts a whole bunch of problems. He goes back to the asylum after having said on televised courtroom television about how the, the fat guards are mean to him. Gleason is there, of course, ready to abuse him, and they do. They do abuse him. They, is, they submit, subject him to horrific physical abuse before taking him to solitary confinement and throwing him in the hole. However, while he's in the hole, Ricky is also in another one of these solitary confinement cells, and Ricky starts to sing When the Saints Go Marching In, a song that Joker had previously started a riot with. He, he hears the guard, played by Gleason, strangle Ricky to death, and the camera just zooms in on his face, his pupils dilating in horror. At this point, because the previous movie had trained me to think that moments of violence and revenge are coming. But that's not what happens next. What happens next is that Joe, is that Arthur Fleck, in his final closing statement to the jury, breaks down. And he says, there is no Joker. My name is Arthur Fleck. I knew what I was doing. And I killed my mother, too the real Arthur Fleck comes through. He is human. He is humanized. He doesn't want to be the Joker. Harley Quinn gets up and leaves, disgusted with him for abandoning the Joker. While the jury works on his conviction, he tries to call her. We see her contemplating suicide while listening to his voice on her voice, on her tape recorder, her uh, voice me uh, message machine. Holy shit. What did we used to call those? Not mailbox. Oh my God. What did we point is, is, is that she can hear, she can hear the message he's leaving. They're not fucking cell phones. It's the eighties. Uh, the point is, is that she hears it and she hears him 
basically begging her because he loves her, but she only loves the Joker. And as the Joker gets ready to be sentenced, he is found guilty of murder. And he is prepared for his punishment when suddenly the whole fucking courtroom, the one side of the courtroom fucking explodes. An explosion throws him from one side of the room to the other. We get a fun, we get a fun shot where we get to see Harvey Gent's face blow the fuck off. Well, half of it, you know, because Two Face. Joker manages to get up. Mo a lot of people around him are fucking dead. F side note: Joker doesn't kill anyone in this movie. Fun fact: Joker gets out. He starts to run. Joker fans find him and try and shuttle him to safety. But he realizes he doesn't want to be with those people. And he, so he gets out and he runs. Ironically, maybe he wouldn't have gone to jail if they had, you know, gotten him the fuck out of there. But eventually he, but he finds his way back to the stairs, the stairs from the first movie. And he sees Harley Quinn is already there. And he runs up to her covered in soot that mimics Joker makeup. The lighting making his suit appear green. And he runs to her. And he says, we can leave. We can get out of here. And she's not having it. She sings to him and he begs her to talk. Eventually, she just leaves him there as the cops roll up. The next time we see Arthur, he is in the asylum. A guard comes and says, hey, you have a visitor. He gets up to go see who the visitor is. Now, I should have seen this ending coming because the film does telegraph it throughout the film there is a young looking dude in the background of some of the scenes in arkham he has tattoos and he has a he has a buzz cut in all honesty he looks like a cross between jared leto's joker and the guy who played joker on the tv show gotham he comes up to him and he's like hey arthur you want to hear a joke and he's like yeah and so he stops on his way to go see whoever's come there to visit him. And this guy, who the camera has been lingering on throughout the film for no apparent reason, just always in the background, looks, turns to him and says, so a psychopath and a clown. A psychopath walks into a bar and sees a clown. And, and the psychopath goes, you know, you, I used to be a fan of you. I used to watch you on the TV all the time. And the clown's like, yeah? He's like, he's like, yeah, can I get you something? And the clown's like, yeah, give me whatever you want. And the psychopath goes, okay, I'll get you what you fucking deserve. Then he stabs Arthur. I might be mutilating that joke, but the point is he's, this guy proceeds to stab Arthur repeatedly in the stomach with a shiv. Arthur falls to the ground, slowly dying. As the camera zooms in on Arthur's smiling face, we can sort of, out of the corner of the frame, see this young killer carve it. It is implied via sound effects and, and slight movement that he is carving a Glasgow smile into his face, his own face. The next Joker has been born. When I saw this ending, it took me a long time to process this ending. And this ending is going to lose some people. But this is where I say this is part of what makes the movie better and makes the previous movie better. You see, going in, I assumed that the Joker fan theory we were working off of was the idea of the inconsistent origin. However, what we're actually working with here is the, cons is the Joker fan theory of many Jokers, or the idea that more than one person has been the Joker, that when one Joker dies, someone merely takes on the mantle. That is what is happening in this film. <clears throat> because this film is not about Arthur Fleck becoming the Joker. This is about how the Joker is an idea, not a man. And before Arthur Fleck dies, the film humanizes him. The film brings him back down to humanity. And we realize, we remember that he is Arthur Fleck. That he is just a man who has been kicked by life 
repeatedly. That this is a man who was given no advantages and only punishments. And that one day when he couldn't take it anymore, he created the Joker. And he didn't mean to create the Joker. And for a little bit, he thought creating the Joker made him somebody. But, but eventually he realized that he wasn't the Joker, that he didn't want to be the person Puddles saw him as, that he is just a man who had murdered people. And because he saw that, he was targeted by a fan who murders him and takes the identity of the Joker, only for Arthur Fleck to be forgotten. The idea of the Joker living on. Arthur Fleck is not the Joker. Arthur Fleck is merely a sad, mentally ill man who is abused by life, who created the persona of the Joker. He's not the Joker, he is the Joker's creator. This movie is not about Joker the man. This movie is about Joker the idea. And honestly, the more I think about this movie, the more I like this movie. That's rarely a statement I say. Because my initial reaction was, what the fuck? But the more I process it and the more I think about it, the more I realize that I actually think this movie is great. This is also a better picture of disability. After his killing spree, he doesn't kill any more people. Arthur Fleck has always just been a guy with a brain injury trying to make his way through life and not getting any steps up. I think that this movie is a better representation of disability and mental illness. And it makes the overall representation better, but also sadder. Because that's what, at the end of the day, that is the, that is the nature of the story. Arthur Fleck, the creator of the Joker, the ultimate joke was on him. He started a joke that got the whole world laughing, but the joke was on him. The acting overall, by the way, is great from everybody. Just throwing that out there. So I need to, I want to add an addendum here. I sort of talked about this in the overall review, but there is an element to the film that I didn't discuss, which is that the film is almost a meta commentary on the reaction to the previous film. Uh, the way that, like I talked about before, the movie sets up the formula of the first film, but then disrupts it at the end. This almost feels like a direct response to people who enjoyed the Joker movie for the wrong reasons. Um, in choosing to humanize him and not make him a serial killer, the film is essentially sort of punishing the audience for being edgelords. In fact, Harley Quinn herself kind of represents that audience, represents people who don't understand the Joker. People weren't supposed to watch the first Joker movie and go, yeah, let's dress as the Joker at protests and burn down cities. That's not, but was never the intention. You're not supposed to idolize this character. And it's almost like someone made a sequel to Fight Club just to point out to you that Tyler Durden was a piece of shit. Um, and in all honesty, I super respect that. So yes, I'm adding this addendum where I just point that out to you. Commentary ends. Thank you for tuning in to Ruben Uncut. Uh, I highly recommend this film. Uh, maybe you'll like it better with these spoilers for all I know. Um, but thank you for tuning in. Please uh, like and subscribe on YouTube or even on Spotify. Please, uh, if you want to contact the program, you can email me at rubenuncut at gmail.com. Thank you for tuning in. How wonderful, whatever, wherever, whoever you are.